uh, but Cosmos has, I'd say, just such a huge amount of the proof of stake assets in the world. And being able to allow these different ecosystems to kind of barter and trade between their specific assets is, I think, a, a really good use case and a, a good thesis for why we should kind of further pursue some of this multi-chain um, uh, distribution of, of, of assets. Yeah, and with that being said, hello and welcome DeFi Times community to yet another episode of This Week in Cosmos. And today, Fabian and I have a very special guest on our show. It's Brent Xu, the founder of Yumi. Hey, Brent, how are you doing? It's such a pleasure to have you on. Hey, doing well. It's it's really great to be here, be here and uh, yeah, super excited about this. Yeah, we too. And before we start to talk um, about so many different topics uh, regarding Yumi. It would be super awesome if you could give us like a short introduction to yourself. So how did you enter the crypto industry and what are you working on right now? Yeah, certainly. So um, uh, I, I joined uh, the crypto industry um, after following this space for, for quite a while. So uh, I got introduced to it through a class uh, in, in, uh, in, in university. Um, taught by Campbell Harvey. So Campbell Harvey was uh, one of the foremost experts in interest rates. Um, and he also happened to be a major libertarian. Uh, he loved Bitcoin and he taught one of the first classes on Bitcoin in 2013. So uh, after taking his class, uh, I dived in uh, down the crypto rabbit hole. And uh, in 2016, I joined Consensus, the software company with Joe Lubin um, back in the day when there was just about 30 people, um, you know, at the, at the, the company and, and uh, help build consensus up to, you know, uh, from a 30 person company to close to a 1200 person company back in the, back in the early days, saw a lot of the, the ups and downs of, of Ethereum. Um, I, I'd say one of the most exciting experiences I had was um, uh, I was in some of the, the meetings around the time of the Dow hack. So Basically, uh, you know, there was meetings with, you know, Joe Lubin, uh, Vitalik, um, some of the miners, uh, Heiko Hees, uh, Left Terrace, um, Andrew Keys, um, uh, Fred Urshan from, from Coinbase. And we uh, really had a chance to hear Vitalik's vision um, for uh, Ethereum 2.0 uh, Serenity back at the time. And a lot of that just kind of reinvigorated my, uh, my passion for this industry. Um, at one point, I was... Uh, project managing and and setting meetings for for uh that that time period and i spent about a uh, 35 days living in the consensus headquarters and uh at one point joe lupin was like man this place smells kind of bad man you got to go take a shit you can't live you can't live in the office man um but uh it was fun times uh it was a a great experience so uh, i transitioned to tendermint uh so i led strategy at tendermint uh, and basically helped set the strategic vision of the Cosmos ecosystem. Uh, got to oversee a lot of development of different protocols like IBC, uh, Gravity Bridge, Gravity Dex, and just many different DeFi tools that are built in the, uh, the Cosmos space. And uh, currently, uh, I'm uh, uh, creating this project called uh, UMI. So UMI is a cross-chain DeFi protocol that internet connects between the Cosmos and the Ethereum blockchain. And we're building out a suite of DeFi tools that can fit into the broader Money Legos ecosystem right now. Um, but uh, prior to all this, I was also a uh, a bond trader. So um, I specialized in uh, MBS products. You know, these assets are very sensitive to interest rates and exhibit a phenomenon called negative convexity. And I say that UMI is kind of an amalgamation of these three areas. So Ethereum DeFi plus Cosmos proof of stake and cross chain plus many concepts from the bond world. And I'd say that. Um, in many ways, UMI is uh, taking, uh, you know, this massive bond market and figuring out the right way to move it onto DeFi and crypto. So, so that's uh, sort of our overarching goal. Well, that's a super impressive uh, story, especially like um, when you uh, told us about like your early days in the Ethereum ecosystem. And like the meetings uh, with with Vitalik and Joe Lubin uh, during the DAO hack, I mean that must be 
that must have been intense uh, meetings. What really impressed me is like your transition from Ethereum towards the Cosmos ecosystem. And yeah, the, like your, 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 your project that you're building, UMI, uh, is like a rising star in the Cosmos ecosystem. And that's why um, I'm so excited uh, to talk about it today. And it's going to be the main topic of today. So to get started, could you give us a broad level overview of what you guys do and how uh, UMI works? Yeah, certainly. So uh, UMI is building on uh, three main pillars right now. Um, the first one is uh, 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 basically interchain leverage. So uh, this can be summed up simply as cross-chain borrowing and lending. So you leverage assets on one blockchain to borrow on another blockchain. So a simple example is that you can leverage assets on Cosmos to borrow Ethereum's. For, uh, the, the first use case we'll have is people will be able to leverage their Cosmos atoms and use them as collateral to borrow Ethereum stable coins like uh, DAI, USDC, Tether, and just all the various stable coins that exist in, in that ecosystem. Um, and uh, yeah, we think that there'll be quite a bit of traction. Uh, and it also works vice versa. People can leverage their assets on Ethereum to borrow other assets on the Cosmos blockchain. So for example, if you want to leverage uh, Ethereum assets and borrow Cosmos atoms and stake them, you can participate in Cosmos proof of stake without actually necessarily needing to buy the, the atoms yourself. Um, the second pillar is uh, multi-chain staking. So this is basically the, building, uh, the ability to allow proof of stake assets to exist on multiple blockchains. So you know, Cosmos assets being able to be uh, accessed as ERC20s on Ethereum and being able to allow this, uh, this, this staking to exist on a, another blockchain. What's gonna be very interesting about this is that uh, users will be able to uh, use their staked assets as collateral. So you can perceive a user who can concurrently um, stake their proof of stake asset, earn the proof of stake yield, and concurrently borrow something like stable coins, which in which the, uh, the yields from staking can, um, uh, can um, can uh, counteract the, the 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 interest rates that are used to pay for borrowing the stable coins. Um, and the third pillar of UMI, which is something I kind of hold near and dear to my heart, would be around the concept of cross-chain DeFi rates. So this uh, uh, takes from the concept of um, the time value of money. So you're probably familiar, a dollar today is worth more than a dollar a year from now. What if we can encapsulate that same idea in crypto um, in, ter in terms of creating a time value of crypto assets, basically um, creating a term structure of interest rates for how crypto can exist in this world. And what this does is it encapsulates time. And we want to use a combination of DeFi rates as well as proof of stake rates to be able to capture this. And so um, in the normal finance world, there's something called a yield curve in the crypto world. Uh, there'll be something called a staking curve based on proof of stake rates. And we think that this can be foundational. This can uh, replace something like LIBOR, which houses you know, close to $500 trillion of value um, based on this base rate. We think that crypto can do much better because it's decentralized and you know, not governed by like a, like a central bank. Yeah, that's super nice. And one cool aspect of UMI uh, that you also touched on earlier is uh, the fact that DeFi protocols uh, can actually interact with staking yields. So, which is a fascinating topic in, in my opinion. And it really shows that DeFi, what, what, what DeFi can actually do in the long run. So could you talk a little bit more about that and how it works? Yeah, certainly. So um, one uh, thought experiment is that um, you know, with like AMM pools these days, AMM pools are great for mean reverting assets. So that's why we see, you know, platforms like Curve that have stable coin pairs like DAI and USDC. Uh, we see, you know, um, uh, AMM pairs on Uniswap with like, you know, stable coins or just assets that tend to not deviate in price that aggressively uh, due to um, a phenomenon called impermanent loss. Um, we think that there could be a great pair between and an AMM between, let's say, a, a unstaked asset and a staked asset. For example, a, a staked asset um, is yielding its proof of stake yield. An unstaked asset is not. 
Um, what becomes really interesting is that when you wrap time time transformations around the uh, the staked asset, for example, if you compartmentalize the staking yield for a staked asset for like a month, two months, six months, uh, 12 months, uh, two years, um, what this does, and, and then you create an AMM pool between that asset and the, and the spot asset, uh, what that does is that it allows the AMM pool to act sort of as this um, facility to indicate the, the time value of that asset um, because the discount uh, of the asset that's staked is representative of the interest rate of the asset that you should expect. And become, it becomes uh, also interesting when you just time lock an asset that's not staked, if you time, if you time lock the, the, the spot asset, but the point is, is a combination of these um, of these staked locked assets as well as um, unstaked assets can be put together into a cohesive ecosystem that gives an indication of what time value should be in a crypto ecosystem. Indeed, I mean, this is super, super interesting to talk about because in my view, this enables uh, a very high level of capital efficiency. And I think this will be like a big game changer for the whole financial industry because, um, yeah, I mean, like how can banks compete with such efficient uh, concepts? And uh, talking about that, one very crucial aspect um, to make all of this happen is interoperability. And of course, there are also other blockchains in the space that claim to have like a similar level of interoperability uh, like uh, Cosmos. So what made you decide to build with Cosmos um, at the end of the day? Certainly. Um, I think in my, in my Cosmos journey, I, I've had a lot of really great eye-opening experiences. So um, one really... Uh, a uh, great experience I, I had in, in learning more about Cosmos was, um, so at DevCon in Osaka, uh, I put together a dinner. Um, we sat down with, uh, so on the Cosmos side, we, we had a, a Jay Kwan, a Zaki Mannion, as well as Christopher Goes and Chango. And we sat down with uh, Vitalik Buterin, uh, Justin Drake, and Danny Ryan. Uh, and we talked about how um, IBC could uh, potentially be used for a cross shard communication protocol for uh, Ethereum 2.0. And I got a lot of takeaways from that dinner because um, uh, what it seemed to be is that IBC could very much be one of these protocols that is, that is you know, quite, uh, quite universal and connecting between different, different ecosystems. It's, it's more of a, a, a layer zero protocol as opposed to a base layer protocol. Uh, you know, Christopher Goes actually expounded upon this at a uh, at EFCC in Paris. So this was this was right before um, COVID hit. Uh, Chris Chris Goes gave the talk remotely. He talked about this concept of IPC being used for this this cross shard communication protocol, uh, cross shard communication at EFCC. And then um, it's interesting. Uh, Georgios from the Paradigm team also expounded upon this uh, via a tweet a few months ago, uh, basically describing how. You know, IBC could be you know um, re rewritten in Solidity. So um, based on all of these uh, features, we think that uh, so th the, these all pointed me towards uh, considering Cosmos as this very strong uh, ecosystem. Um, one framework that um, that I've heard in the past is that uh, when you look at dimensionality, like Bitcoin has. Uh, limited dimensionality is not very flexible. It's very rigid, you know, and that's what makes it a great store of value. Um, Ethereum, on the other hand, is based on one like homogenous consensus. It's highly interoperable within the uh, homogenous consensus mechanism that is Ethereum, and it's 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 very it's very dimensional. It's very flexible, um, but Cosmos sits at the middle. Um, basically, uh, it it is a bit more rigid in structure. Um, it has medium amounts of dimensionality, but it has high interoperability when you're able to add this protocol like IBC. And uh, basically, you're able to have uh, self-sovereign networks that exist amongst themselves. And if there's a bad network, they can be locked up from the, from, from the ecosystem. But seeing this configuration just makes me really think that Cosmos is sort of the right direction to go in terms of the evolution of many different crypto ecosystems. And, and so that, that's why I, I 
uh, I, I, I'm very happy to be building within this space. Yeah, definitely. Um, even Pang Zong um, explained it very well uh, how impactful the um, the launch of IBC was. He basically said that IBC was the invention of uh, shipping in an industry uh, with a lot of silos. So um, yeah, I couldn't agree more here. And uh, thank you so much for sharing the insights here. Um, but regarding IBC, in your white paper, you yeah you uh, you state that you want to um, connect with IBC and I think that's pretty obvious uh, you just mentioned all the reasons so it would be super cool if you could give us like kind of an imagination when um, on which date um, Ume is IBC enabled certainly so um, you know we, we're, we're aiming for that uh, end of Q4 main that launch um, uh, I guess I guess that that zeroes in on on the December time period. Um, yeah, we we want IBC to be to be enabled, uh, you know, right out the door. Um, we see just such an important um, interaction with with all of these ecosystems. And I mean, when you think about it, like all of these cross chain solutions right now of like connecting between a like a, a layer one Ethereum versus with a layer two scaling solution. Um, you know the initial connection is doable, but you know withdrawing takes, you know, like seven day time periods when when interacting with these layer two scaling solutions. Um, when you think about IBC, you know uh, this is a fast finality connection. Um, every every time you make an IBC transaction, that's a that's a five second finality transaction, and so that is a substantial uh, improvement to what we can see and how Ethereum interacts with. Like layer two scaling solutions, and so we hope to take lessons learned from this this you know uh, this this superior architecture to be used to be built across the rest of the blockchain ecosystem. So, um, yeah, we 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 kind of see see this as as just one of the major the major selling points of this protocol. Yeah, definitely, and I I really think that IBC could become like the the um, standardized way blockchains could um, communicate with each other in, in the future. And we th see this like in front of our eyes, like, um, I, like my favorite website at the moment is, is called mapofzones.com. And this is a very nice visualization of how the, the Cosmos ecosystem is growing at the moment. And it feels like, like every single day there's, there's a new chain like uh, being added to the network. And um, it, it, like the Cosmos ecosystem is growing so fast at the moment. Uh, my next question is, do you think there's, it, like, uh, there's a chance that Cosmos could reach like a uh, like escape velocity uh, right, uh, right now? So, so do you think that there's a big network effect going on, uh, which could increase exponentially in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, when you look at it from a Metcalf's law perspective, um, this is a little bit like uh, uh, the invention of a telephone. You know, when there's one telephone, you know, big deal. Like, what? What's the big deal? This is just one device. But when you actually create a network of devices connecting, uh, being connected through this telecommunication network. Um, the, the the possibilities are quite vast. Um, with with IBC, I think I think it's it's quite analogous to that. Um, you know, in the current configuration, uh, you know, there, there there there's quite a few zones that have activated IBC. Um, but I think what the ecosystem doesn't realize is just the vast network effect that's possible after more and more protocols discover IBC. Um, you know, many, many networks out there already be built on the Cosmos SDK, um, you know, uh, Binance Chain, uh, Crypto.com, like uh, major, major networks out there. Um, even, even Facebook, you know, has, has different tender, Tendermint components, you know, weaved into its, its architecture uh, after forking the Tendermint consensus and using that to create hot stuff, uh, which is the underpinning uh, protocol for Facebook Libra and, uh, and Diem. Um, once, once people realize the network effect, I think that um, I think I think it's 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 going to be pretty astronomical um, how quickly things grow. And so, 
uh, you know, these days we're just patiently building and uh, we're looking forward to a lot of innovation that's going to happen because uh, uh, IBC is just such a powerful uh, protocol for interconnecting between these different networks. Yeah, I totally agree. We kind of see the first signs for an upcoming network effect as we speak. I think the first obvious sign was uh, the launch of Osmosis because suddenly you were able to use the whole Cosmos ecosystem and everything uh, came together. So for me, this was like the very first sign to see, okay, now we are starting. But I want to ask you one question because in your white paper, you state that um, you are kind of inspired by Ave. So Ume is a little bit, is um, used Ave as an inspiration. And Ave, what Ave is doing right now, they launch on different chains, they launch on Avalanche and um, yeah, they are expanding, but they are more focused, they are focusing more on an multi-chain on a multi-chain future so they try to launch on as many chains as possible but there are people who criticize that because you start to spread your liquidity across different blockchains so many people say an interchain future would be better for these protocols to um, keep uh, the liquidity uh, concentrated so there's kind of a discussion around this topic so um, what is your position in that discussion yeah, certainly. And, you know, um, you know, we're, we're, we're big fans of, uh, you know, what, what the Abe folks are doing just because um, they, they were, you know, such an early player in, in this space. Um, when it comes to that multi-chain approach, uh, I'd say it's dependent upon the, uh, the technological infrastructure. So um, uh, as you can see with, um, you know, something like, like SushiSwap, they have, you know, integrated with every every network out there and in some ways uh liquidity can be can be chopped up a bit um with with the interchain with what cosmos is doing um i do see ad advantages of taking this ibc route because you can have your own inherent blockchain and basically your blockchain interacts with other blockchains via ibc um and you're able to use this common communi communication interface as the focal point upon which the rest of the DeFi ecosystem uh, interacts. Um, I think uh, in this in this space, there's a lot of desire to be like you know there's there's like base layer versus you know if if we're if we're a hub if we're if we're if we're a zone. Um, I would say that um, from the chopping up liquidity perspective. Uh, there are tendencies for liquidity to aggregate uh, in the in the main chain upon which a protocol is launched. Uh, we saw some of these dynamics with like um, with with Avalanche. We saw some of these dynamics with how uh, projects are being built on on Polygon or Arbitrum. Um, I think I think the way I see it is that um, we do want to encourage uh, uh, liquidity to have access to many different ecosystems. For example, um, uh, one, of the, one of the main selling points for UMI is that we wanna leverage between uh, Cosmos and Ethereum. So allow uh, users on uh, Cosmos to borrow like stable coins on, on Ethereum. I think the, the best perspective I have is that um, uh, it's highly dependent upon the existing assets uh, between different networks. Um, I think some networks have more of one type of asset versus other networks that might have um, other types of assets. For example, you know, uh, Ethereum has most of the stable coins in the world, uh, but Cosmos has, I'd say, just such a huge amount of the proof of stake assets in the world. And being able to allow these different ecosystems to kind of barter and trade between their specific assets is, I think a, a really good use case and a, a good thesis for why we should kind of further pursue some of this multi-chain um, uh, distribution of, of, of assets. Yeah, I definitely see your point in that discussion. And um, what is also important to mention here is that Ethereum may has more stable coins today. Um, the Cosmos ecosystem also makes um, yeah, big progress uh, regarding that. So, uh, due to the tariff, uh, due, due to the Terra upgrade, Columbus Five, uh, a lot of things uh, changed. So, let us see how this uh, plays out. But uh, I want to come back to Ume one more time. Um, I mean, in the end of the day, you basically revolutionize the staking industry because you make staking even 
more efficient. And um, even JP Morgan estimates that the staking industry will completely blow up after um, ETH 2.0 is entirely shipped. And now we even live in times with like a significant inflation. So staking, the whole staking economy could become more attractive over the time. So what is your take on the uh, current state of the staking industry? And yeah, how do you view the future of the staking economy? Do you basically see that we will enter a new financial era? Yeah, so I think that staking um, has the ability to uh, change the perspective of how an economy should view inflation. So, um, you know, there, there have been ideas in the past around how proof of stake can be a proxy of, of a certain form of economic growth. And the way we see it is that, um, you know, these days people perceive um, uh, base interest rates based on uh, just just different term structures uh, created by the Federal Reserve or created by different industry standards. Um, uh, you know, uh, for for banks, they they used to use a, a, a reference rate called LIBOR. Uh, now they're transitioning to something called SOFR, um, and these are just industry standards that are being used. Um, we think that with proof of stake. Uh, you know, based, based on my earlier points, proof of stake can in many ways replace something like LIBOR or replace something like SOFOR as a reference rate. Uh, this internal economic yield that, that's being generated by a crypto asset has just a, a world of possibilities because what it does is it represents an internal protocol-based inflation that's, uh, that's determined by, you know, an inherent uh, uh, BFT-based consensus when, uh, from the perspective of Tendermint and from other protocols, you know, their respective, uh, their respective consensus protocols. Um, but uh, staking economy is here to stay, and, and we see it with just major staking providers just uh, um, uh, that are, you know, uh, establishing strong presence uh, in, in the space. You know, on, on, on our side, we're, we're big fans of the, of the validators that are supporting uh, the, the UMI ecosystem, um, you know, we're, we're fans of the, the Cosmos stations of the world, the, the, the figments, the steak fish, the, um, the, the, the chorus ones of the world. And we're just really excited about how, how a lot of these major uh, validators and staking providers are just expanding and, and looking at new evolutions of how this ecosystem should evolve. Yeah, um, I mean, everybody is super excited uh, about that. And especially if you are in crypto, I think this also changed a lot of things regarding a bear market or a bull market, because before we had the staking economy in that size, people were only able to make money by speculating. And now you can really create uh, economic value. So um, yeah, I think uh, times change pretty fast. But speaking about the time, um, you mentioned it already um you were pretty deep into bonds and yeah there's one uh, question that i that that it was um in my head the whole time um i mean we saw 2008 2008 was basically also the birth year of uh, bitcoin because it uh, basically smashed the whole financial industry and one reason for that were uh, cdos and uh, CDOs are now uh, forbidden as far as I know, but still there are similar products on the market right now. And uh, the whole financial industry doesn't seem too strong at the moment. Um, so what is your take on the current bond market? And um, where do you see the role of Yumi in order to revolutionize uh, this uh, part of the financial industry? You know, it's kind of serendipitous that you put it that way. It's it's like a, a broken bond market was the reason for why crypto was created in the first place. Uh, Bitcoin came out right after the uh, the 08 financial crisis, and and it is it is quite serendipitous how how things have evolved. And uh, based on that, that that's what we believe. We think the bond markets are completely broken. And keep in mind, the bond markets are you know. Like like a multi-trillion dollar market, um, when it when you include things like derivatives and then other assets, you you kind of get into that quadrillion like quadrillion like dollar value, and so um, 
our markets are the biggest markets in the world and they're not very transparent. You know, I, I was on a bond desk for six years and um, I, I did not think that the financial markets were necessarily governed by like logic and reason and math as opposed to just more, you know, internal human uh, relationships and, and psychology as it relates to the, these these networks and ecosystems. And I'd say with UMI, we're, we're trying to redefine things. Um, we're trying to rebuild those huge markets using decentralized protocols and open source technology. And so we think in the future, um, you know, with UMI, borrowing and lending is the start, uh, proof of stake is the start. But we want to introduce the ideas of, 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 of credit and future value in, in, in crypto. We want to introduce the concept of, of time value, of duration in crypto, because, you know, at some point, you know, uh, Uniswap might want to issue a bond. At some point, Yearn might want to issue a bond. At, at some point, the Cosmos uh, hub, uh, uh, Terra, uh, Osmosis, um, Region, um, uh, persistence, you know, these, these, these networks might want to issue a bond. They might want to tap into the, the debt capital markets. Um, validators might be interested in issuing bonds because validators probably have a lot of, you know, capital, re capital uh, needs when it comes to uh, um, uh, 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 ca cash users for, for uh, funding their operations. And uh, the broader vision of the UMI ecosystem is to uh, help build that infrastructure to ensure that um, this crypto ecosystem is going to have, you know, different forms of full faith and credit. This crypto ecosystem is going to have, you know, different perspectives on duration and also future value. And so we want to build that foundation. And we think that we have the, uh, the tools, we have the, uh, the knowledge, as well as the just you know, the, the right builders to to build at that that foundation for the future development of crypto. Yeah, and I think many people are now very interested in that uh, in following your progress um, that will take place, especially in Q4. You mentioned it already. We are all looking forward to IBC. So, what is what is a good hop of point to learn more about Umi, and um, yeah, what is a good hop of point to engage with the rest of your community? Uh, sorry, uh, 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 did you mean, um, could you could you repeat that question, please? Yeah, do you have some good hop off points to uh, to learn more about uh, UMI and uh, to engage with the rest of your community? Uh, certainly. Um, so uh, 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 places to look include, um, uh, so, um, you know, we're, we're very active on, on Twitter. We're really grateful for our, our community. Uh, we're, we're also really grateful for, for our Discord ecosystem. Um, you know, we have uh, quite, quite a few validators that are interested in interacting with us. Um, and we're also just, just grateful in general for all the folks that are interested in uh, participating in this, in this ecosystem. Uh, for, for DeFi, community is key. So, you know, we're, we're very fortunate to have our community members. Um, and we look forward to uh, once the community wants to interact with our um, incentivized test nets, uh, we'll have a few programs. Um, so right now we're going through UMI Avengers uh, phase one. So this is the rise of the UMI Avengers. Um, it, it is a uh, incentivized test net for validators. Uh, we will have a phase two uh, as well, um, where there will be an adversarial test net. Um, but uh, basically, we're we're just uh, very much looking forward to this community involvement. Um, there'll be uh, liquidity mining incentives as well as other programs to better allow participation from the, the broader uh, community ecosystem. And, and we're just looking forward to further developing these and, and just making sure that there are ways for folks to get involved. Yeah, you heard it here first. And as always, you can find all the links in the description below. With that being said, Brent, it was such a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for sharing all your insights. And we are looking forward to uh, see you at the conference, CCC Lisbon. And um, yeah, we're also looking forward to see UME enabling IBC. So thanks again, and I hope I see you soon. Thanks so much. It was really good to be here. Yeah, really appreciate it, guys. <laughs>